I was excited when I heard that Canon was launching its first ever RF mount APS-C cameras, the R7 and the R10. The R7 was particularly interesting to me with its high megapixel sensor and great looking video specs. Now, although the R7 is obviously aimed at sports and wildlife shooters, this is the first Canon APS-C body we're gonna have the opportunity to try full frame RF lenses on. So I was curious to see how these lenses performed with the R7 for portraits. I also wanted to put it head to head with my R6 to see how a high megapixel APS-C sensor performs next to a lower megapixel full frame sensor with the same lenses. I'll also take a quick look at video from the R7 and compare it to the R6 and even the C70. This is obviously a much lower cost camera, so it's gonna be interesting to see how it holds up against the other two. So let's get started. The first thing I wanted to do with the R7 was try it with a few of my favorite RF prime lenses I use the most often with my full frame Canons. I started with the RF 35mm 1.8, shooting it wide open. The field of view of this lens after the crop is roughly 50mm. Here's the first shot of the day I took, and on the back of the camera the colours and sharpness looked great. Here's a closer look, showing pretty good detail captured. In terms of autofocus, the camera was doing a really good job of tracking Rachel's eyes, even with distracting elements in the foreground. Now and again though, the focus would snap to the background, but I mostly put that down to user error. Disappointingly, however, after reviewing the images at home later on, the majority of the shots were soft, despite the camera tracking the eye well. I've used the R5 and R6 for many months and very rarely get an out of focus shot in situations like these. So I think this is an issue likely unique to this camera and lens combination. I was excited to try the 50mm 1.2 in the R7, which after accounting for the APS-C crop gives you roughly a 75mm field of view. The focus issues were now mostly gone and we see a big step up in terms of details resolved with this lens. Now I switched over to the 85mm 1.2 lens for these shots and this lens produced the best results in terms of sharpness and details captured. After the crop this lens becomes roughly 125mm which is a focal length I'm not particularly used to. For your close-up classic portrait shot, it performed really well. It tracked Rachel's eye perfectly, even with her hair in front of her face. Now, out of nowhere, the rain started really pouring, so we had to run back to the car and wait out the rain. We moved on to a new field and was rewarded with an amazing sunset. I wanted to go wide to capture this amazing scene, so I grabbed the 35mm 1.8 again. The camera did pretty well under these conditions where I chose to have Rachel backlit and exposed for the sunset behind. I had to crank the ISO up just a little bit at this point, only to around 320, but already the noise was really apparent, especially when recovering the shadows. As you can see in the close-ups, the images on this lens are just not that sharp and are almost hazy. I imagine a high megapixel APS-C sensor is probably quite challenging for a budget lens like this, which is designed for full frame after all. Switching back to the 50mm immediately shows what this camera is capable of, with much cleaner, sharper results. And these were some of my favourite shots from the day. The 1.2 max aperture allowed me to step the ISO back down a bit, giving me a little less noise in the images too. At this point we pretty much lost all the light, bringing the shoot to an end. So now let's take a more controlled look at each lens on the R7 and compare the results to the R6. Starting with the RF 35mm 1.8, Putting aside the earlier issues, this lens does feel at home on the R7's small, lightweight body, 
and this was the lens I was most excited to pair it with, but ended up being pretty disappointed by the results. The 50mm 1.2 looks and feels pretty good on the R7 despite its smaller grip. As mentioned earlier, we get an easy to use 75mm field of view. Perfect for portraits without having to stand too far back. It's a familiar focal length most of us have used in a standard zoom. It offers a decent step up in quality from the 35mm we used earlier. Now the 85mm 1.2 is starting to get a little uncomfortable on this smaller body. The roughly a 120mm equivalent focal length was also a little challenging to use for anything other than headshots just because of how far away you have to stand from your subject. Many people do love this kind of focal length though and it's just not one that I'm used to. The results on this camera are the most consistently sharp and impressive though, with amazing depth of field and compression due to the added working distance. So now let's see how these results compare to the R6. The differences may not be immediately obvious but if we take a closer look, the R6 is significantly cleaner, clearer and sharper especially with this 35mm lens. The colours still match up pretty well, but with each lens, the R6 just seems to capture way more skin detail, despite the lower megapixel count. The R7 shots look consistently soft in comparison. Again, it's a high megapixel APS-C sensor, so it's going to be more challenging on these lenses, but I was surprised by just how much better the R6 seemed to do every time. These are as good as the results seem to get from the R7 using the 85mm 1.2, but still, with the same lens, the R6 just seems to pull ahead. Video, however, is a different story when comparing to the R6 and even the C70. The R6 looks amazing as usual, but the R7 may be just as good. They match up really well in terms of colour and dynamic range, and it even keeps up with the C70, which shares a similar sensor size. I'm zooming out on the R7 and C70 here to account for the crop and you can barely notice a difference in depth of field in the real world. The R7 is a great option for video with no overheating and great autofocus. Now, when it comes to handling with the R7, there are some key differences compared to Canon's full frame offerings. I do like this quick switch that they added to the power dial, which allows you to quickly switch into video mode. I do wish the R6 had this. I also like the fact that they included two card slots in such a low cost body, which is uncharacteristic of Canon compared to the EOS R for example which just has a single card slot. There are a few things I don't like however, mainly this dial around the joystick which I could get used to, but I'm just not a fan of the D-pad in comparison to the R6's typical rear dial and command dial. But I'm sure there's probably some reasoning behind this design change that I'm probably just missing, perhaps specific to sports and wildlife shooters. My biggest personal gripe however with this camera is the reduction in the size of the grip. If you have larger hands like me, your pinky finger is not going to have a home on that grip, making heavier lenses uncomfortable to use. It's less of an issue on smaller, lighter lenses like the 35mm 1.8 and it's probably quite well suited to those that have smaller hands. If that's you, you probably really appreciate the smaller, lighter body. So that rounds out my time with the R7 and ultimately, considering its affordability, this camera has a lot going for it. It's got a high megapixel sensor, amazing autofocus, high frames per second capture, and of course, excellent video specs. Now, unfortunately, I wasn't particularly blown away with the image quality in terms of photo from the R7. However, until we see some high quality APS-C RF mount lenses, it's probably too early to judge it. I'm also just not really the target market for this camera. It's obviously aimed at sports and wildlife shooters. And I probably wouldn't recommend it for portraits or even, unfortunately, events because of its noise performance. Now, what I would recommend instead is looking for a used EOS R for a similar price, or even an RP. For me, the image quality I got out of the R was leaps and bounds above the R7, in terms of photo at least. For video, however, to me, the R7 is a great pickup, as it offers you pretty similar specs to the R6 in a much lower cost body. And as far as I'm aware, it doesn't overheat either. But if you are just starting out and you're looking for an APS-C camera to shoot portraits, I would probably point you in Fujifilm's direction. The X-T3 and X-T4 are incredible cameras for a similar price point, 
and the main reason is just that their lens lineup is much more fleshed out in comparison to Canon's APS-C lens lineup right now. To me, the R7 only really makes sense as a B camera for somebody who already shoots sports or wildlife with one of Canon's full frame RF mount cameras. Now I have included the raw files from the comparison in a link in the description below which is free to download so you can see for yourself the image quality differences between the R7 and the R6. It is early days for the R7 though and I'm looking forward to using it more in the future and seeing what Canon does with its RF mount APS-C lens lineup. Hopefully this video might have helped somebody out there who's considering the R7. If you have had a chance to use it, please let me know how you got on with it down in the comments. And thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.